And we're going to be in, let's see, we're going to be the first 11 verses. And then next Sunday, we're going to, actually, we're going to look again at the 11 verses. And then possibly the third week, we're going to look in the same 11 verses. <laughs> in other words, we're going to spend a little time in this passage. Because as I began to study and I began to, you know, peel back the layers, as it were, uh, I saw several things going on at several different layers, several different levels, and um, I don't think I'm going to, to dispel the mystery of it all. I think I'm just going to enhance it for you. But uh, anyway, so if you want to mark Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, you're going to be in the right spot for the next couple of weeks at least. This event we're going to look at is what's considered or called the first miracle of the church. In other words, after the church was founded at Pentecost, this is the first miracle. And one of the things we're going to see in this miracle is that whenever God does a miracle, it's always a part of a greater plan. He's not doing miracles just for the sake of doing something, you know, impressive. In John chapter 9, you don't have to go over there, but I'm just using this to illustrate the point. Jesus healed a blind man. He spat in the dirt, he made mud, he put it in the man's eyes and had him wash in the pool of Siloam. And immediately the man could see. And this miracle prompted a question by his disciples. I'm sorry, I love that sound. That's why I know I wouldn't be a good parent anymore. Because it would just be chaos and I would be loving every minute of it and they would get no discipline. But that's fine. I, I'm at Grandpa H. I'm ready to spoil them and send them home. Anyway, this miracle prompted a question. When Jesus healed the blind man, it says John 9, the first two verses of the, of the chapter says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. It wasn't just to, you know, show that God was powerful. It wasn't just to, you know, he didn't need to prove anything to us or impress us in any way. He just wanted to display the works of God and glorify God. There's always a greater plan at work when God does a miracle. Every miracle recorded in Scripture is part of a greater plan. And fortunately, Scripture almost always reveals that plan to us within the context of the passage in which it's recorded. It's not just about the miracle. And this is what we see happening in Acts 3. I know you've heard it, but anyway... Wait a minute. Where did I go? Hold on. Da, 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 da. I love computers, and sometimes I hate computers. Here we go. This miracle has a purpose, and this miracle has a person. Uh, how many remember the ad campaign back in the army when it was, you know, the ad was be all you can be. All right, that was at its highlight when I was at that age. I was ready to be all I can be. And when mom found out I was going to talk to the recruiter, she called my uncle. Uncle Gary, he was a, he was a airborne ranger. And he received a silver star. He was a tunnel rat in Vietnam. Um, what is it? Silver star, three bronze stars, and three purple, two bronze stars, and three purple hearts. So he was highly decorated officer and uh, my hero. So I'm about to go talk to the recruiter, and instead of talking to the recruiter that day, my uncle showed up unexpectedly and said, I've bled enough for all of us. And there wasn't anything going on in the mid 80s that nothing, you know, Iran and all that stuff wasn't even on the horizon at that moment. But they had this ad, be all you can be, and I wanted to be all I could be. And, and this ad ran for 21 years until just into 2001, started in 1980. Well, this month they decided to renew the campaign. 
I don't know if you've seen it, but on TV, actually they just paused it because the guy that did the narration for the commercials just got arrested for domestic violence, and so the Army suspended the campaign for a moment. But I'm sure they'll figure it out and start the campaign over because it was the most successful ad campaign the Army ever ran. It's got a strong appeal to the human spirit. At least it did to me when I was 17 years old. It tugs at your desire to reach your full potential and to be your best. What I have discovered since then, oh, and by the way, I really appreciate our servicemen. You guys have put your life on the line, and even if you never really physically did that, when you signed up and took your oath, you were putting your life out there for us, and we appreciate it. The Army isn't the only place where you can be all you can be, though. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to restore us to God. He died, he rose from the grave so that we could be forgiven of our sin and restored to God. And in the army, you can be all you can be for a time. Because if I were been in the army, they would have probably let me go quite some time ago now. But in God's kingdom, you will reach your full potential, not just for a time, but for eternity. All right? You know, you don't have to look to that retirement moment. You'll be able to be at your peak and your full potential for eternity with God. So the question is, do you want to be all you can be in God's kingdom? So let's talk about this miracle. Let me read it for you. Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that's called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I wish I'd have seen that. I wish I'd have been there for that one. It's the most exciting moments in all of the New Testament, and I wish I'd have seen it, but at least I get to read about it. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognizing him, him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While they clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, Solomon's porch, astounded. I love those words. Wonder, amazement, astounded. Those are words we need to rediscover in our churches. This passage, like I said, is the first great miracle. And I began to put it together and, you know, study this passage. I realize there's a lot more here that we can learn from just one that I have time for in just one message. So we're going to spend a little time. Today, I want to focus on the person that God uses. Have you ever asked yourself, how can God use me? What can I do? You know, have you ever walked away dejected from asking the question, well, I don't see that I'm any use to God at all. I, I can't. I'm not a public speaker and I'm not, you know, a Bible scholar or whatever. I don't know what the excuse is, but have you walked away dis disappointed because you're not sure how God can use you? And you see people doing things in the church, you think, well, I can't do that. Well, let me give you a little encouragement. There, is a, there are a ton of things that need to be done in this church that I cannot do. I need your help. Now, I know I do a couple of things that you're not comfortable doing, and that's fine because I'm a little bit of a ham, and I don't mind being up here making a fool of myself sometimes. Actually, the foolishness of the gospel is what I'm about, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians. But there are many, many things to be done in this church, and God has uniquely set you in a position here to do that. And maybe you haven't discovered it yet. That's okay. That's why we're all together here, to help each other out and figure out what we're about. 
and what God has for us. So we're going to focus on becoming the kind of person that God can use. Because here's part of the problem. If the opportunity is there and you're not ready, that's a boat you don't want to miss. I've missed a couple of opportunities because I was not prepared. And I kick myself to this day for it. So today we're going to focus on the kind of person that God uses when he wants to change lives. Next week we're going to talk about some classic elements that are central to all of God's miracles. And then finally I think we're going to look at uh, the purposes of God's miracles. So today it's the person. How do you become a person that God uses? Well, we're just going to walk through a few verses here and find out. It says, verse 1, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. I don't know if you know what a Hebrew clock looked like, but ninth hour does not mean nine o'clock for them. Whenever God has done a miracle, as far as I could tell through my study, whenever God does a miracle through a person, that person was on the same page with God. That person was on the same wavelength, if you will. In other words, they were right with God, or at least they got right with God pretty quick. Think of the prophets, think of Jesus, think of the apostles. They weren't living in sin at the Holiday Inn when they performed these miracles. They were walking with the Lord. They didn't have some hidden secret sin and think, oh, well, God's going to work through me anyway. That's not these guys. These guys were going to the temple to pray. And their lives were an open book and they completely surrendered to God. The person that God uses is going to be a prayerful person. And I want to expound on that and say that the person that God uses in this way to change lives is going to be on the same page with God. Fully submitted, fully serving. I can, you know, I just, I, it's, it, it's not that God can't use imperfect people. He does. Because I'm an imperfect man. And I pray every day that God use me in some way. And as I was talking to John, even before the service today, I don't even care if it's in the pulpit. At some point along the way, my, my role with this church changes. I just want to be a part of the ministry. I don't care where. And if it ends up, we already know it's not repairing toilets because I fixed it and it leaked. But uh, <laughs> that was awfully disappointing. But if it's scrubbing those toilets with a toothbrush and I'm where God wants me to be and I'm where God is moving and working, then give me a toothbrush. I just want to be there. And I think part of it is going to be depending upon me to be a prayerful person who is honest and open-hearted toward God. Peter wasn't hiding anything. There's nothing left to hide. He wasn't perfect. But he was a prayerful, godly, holy man. The point is to stay right with God and talk to God often. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. How many of you know how to pray while driving to work in the morning? See, that's how it happens. You know, how many of you know how to pray when you wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep and you're laying there? Yeah, that's praying without ceasing. You know how to do this, and you know how to become this person. So the first step, if you want to be used by God, is become a prayerful person. Talk with God. Second step is in verse 2. See how easy the Lord makes this for us? It says, A lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid out daily at the gate of the temple that's called Beautiful Gate and asked alms. You know, on one hand, it wasn't hard to see that this man had a need in his life. I mean, he's lame. He's laying right there where, you know, hundreds of people pass by all the time on their way to worship God every day. And I mean, where would be a better place? If you're looking for, to, 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 you know, to cash in on the pity and, you know, good intentions of folks, uh, you know, yeah, a smart beggar would be outside the church doors at the end of service each Sunday. Because that's what this guy was doing practically. On the other hand, 
it was so normal for him to be there every single day that he'd probably become very easy to ignore. When I was in Dallas as a student, in, you know, in the city, and uh, man, I'm glad I'm not there anymore, because it was a seven mile drive from my apartment to school, to the campus. And if I left even five minutes too late, it turned into a 30 minute commute in the rush hour traffic in the morning. But there was this one guy always there on this particular corner. And he was one of the first guys that I ever saw that was being honest about things. He says, his little placard said, why lie, need beer. <laughs> I think I, you know, I wasn't going to help buy him beer, but I did appreciate his honesty. <laughs> and as a college student, you know, poor college student, even if I wanted to help, I didn't have the money for it. A lot of people probably ignored this crippled man at the temple gate. It was just too common to see. And it's what a lot of us still do today. And I don't know if it's because we don't care. Maybe that's true about some folks who honestly just don't care. But I think most of us, we just don't believe we can really help. Isn't it right? I mean, well, I'll give him a couple bucks, but is that really going to help him? You know, and am I really helping him or am I enabling this guy? You know, so there's a lot of confusion. You just don't know if you could really help him. We who are in Christ do not see the world and the needs of the world the way the world sees. We have different eyes. And we have the power to help people in need in ways that the world does not have the power. So while maybe in some ways we can justify our lack of concern or our lack of action. Because realistically, no, I do not have enough silver or gold to help that person. But what I do have, I give to you. And that's something every one of us who are in Christ possesses. It's not about being rich, at least not in the world's eyes. It's about recognizing the riches of heaven and the gospel. So while most people can justify their lack of concern, I don't think that would work for us. John, 1 John chapter 3, which our Sunday school class, I'm going to read you two verses. We spent probably two months on this. But we know love. That he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Jesus said it this way. He said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I love myself to treat myself to a ribeye steak once in a while. <laughs> I ought to love my neighbor enough to invite him over for one too. If you want to be used by God, do not ignore the needs of people around you. So number one, be a prayerful person. Number two, do not ignore needs. Don't look at them the way the world looks at them. Look at them through the eyes of Christ who lives in you. Third, next phrase. See how simple this gets? The next phrase. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Peter and John listened. They heard him say that. You know? Luke is writing Acts. Luke wasn't there when it happened. Evidently, Peter and John remembered and told Luke, hey, this guy was begging for alms, and he, he asked us for alms, and, and I looked at him. Peter recalls, you know, and this is what we have. Obviously, several people routinely helped this crippled man in some way. Otherwise, he would not be sitting at that gate. Think about it. If it was not a good gate to sit at, he would have been somewhere else. So it was a good gate to sit at, and he was doing all right, asking for help, just sitting there. But how many people walked past him without noticing? I think most folks. I would have been in that crowd because I am a poor guy. Well, at least, you know, in some ways. Financially, I'm not a rich guy. 
Before Jesus came, maybe even Peter and John had walked past this crippled man going while they were going into the temple a few times. I don't know. But anyway, this time they did not. You see, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you are a prayerful person on the same page with God, and you start seeing people through God's eyes, you start listening to people through God's ears. If you want to be used by God, learn to listen to others. And here's a little caveat. Most of us listen in order to respond. In other words, the whole time we're listening to somebody, we're crafting our little you know, response inside our head. Well, I'm going to say my word better than they told me their word. You know? And then we get this you know, competition thing going in the conversation. You know, and my words are more eloquent than your words. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not doing it for earthly praise. We're doing it for heavenly treasure. I got more treasure than you do. <laughs> you know, we start competing. If you want to be used by God, don't compete. Listen, not to respond, but to help. Really hear them. My wife, once in a while, she'll say something, and, and it's like, she looks at me, and like, no, you really didn't hear me. And it's like, no, I, you said, duh, duh, duh. Yeah, and you think that's what it meant. Yeah, well, learn to listen. All right, number four. Don't be afraid to stand out. Don't be afraid to stand out. Look at the next phrase. We're just following the scripture right along as it goes. And Peter directed his gaze, the crippled man's gaze, at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, the word says. Jesus said, we are the light of the world. It's not optional. He said, we are the salt of the earth. He didn't ask us if we wanted to be. He said, you are a city on a hill. He's given us the keys to the kingdom. We have the power to save the entire world. We represent Jesus and his church everywhere we go. We represent him in the home. We represent him at work. We represent him at school when we're driving our car. You know, that we're not supposed to be the road rager. We're supposed to represent Christ by the way we drive. We represent Christ standing in line at the grocery store. We should not be afraid when the time comes to say, look at me. I am a life that has been changed by the power of Jesus Christ. I was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. I was crippled, now I walk. I was dead, and now I live. Every one of us who calls upon Christ and has him as Lord and Savior can say these things. And it's going to attract attention because people are excited when they see a life that has been changed. And your life has been changed, has it not? What is your miracle? Is it your marriage? If it hadn't been for the Lord, Christy and I would not still be married. Is it a family member? I have seen God do miraculous things. I have seen God change lives even within my own family. I have seen God reach down and carry us through times that the average person would never understand how we got through it with our sanity. That's power. Is it not enough that it took a miracle to save your soul? If Jesus can raise from the dead, what can he do for you? If Jesus can raise from the dead, what is it that he could do for your friend who is not saved that you've been wondering about how to talk to? If Jesus can raise from the dead, what could he do through you? Don't be afraid to stand out. God has done amazing, wonderful things in your life. And people want to know. They need to know. And that is the power for them to be saved and come to Christ too. It doesn't matter what age. doesn't matter your friends. Somebody's, you know, everybody has somebody. So, 
Don't be afraid to stand out. Fifth one. We're going to get out here a couple minutes earlier than last week. That's not saying much, is it? Be willing to give. All right? In fact, be willing to sacrificially give. But we'll get to that one, you know, more on that later, another week. But suppose that you see a person on the street corner, you know, with the sign out, and they're begging for help. So you roll down your window, and you hold out a couple of bucks. The guy comes up to you and says, oh, I don't need any help. I'm just out here getting exercise. He can put your money back in your pocket. What do you think the likelihood of that is happening? Not hardly. If you see me out on the street corner and hold the cash out, I'm taking it. <laughs> so this is not for his own benefit. People are in need, and some of them are humble enough to ask, and some are not. We know that. The lame man was asking for help. He did not get what he was asking for, but he got more than he was asking for. Be prepared to give. You may not be able to give them what they're asking for, but by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will be able to give them more than they were asking for. That's good news. Some people think that, you know, I'm just one person and I really can't make a lot of difference, but I think history teaches us differently. I want to tell you a little funny story from about 250 years ago. During colonial times, each colony was allowed to elect its own representatives to the central legislature, the governing body of the 13 colonies. And according to legend, there was a Federalist, that is, they had a, the Federalist Party. Today we've got, you know, what is it, Democrats and Republicans. But anyway, we got two parties. Well, their two parties were the Democrat Party and the Federalist Party. All right? Well, there was a Federalist Party farmer from Rhode Island. He's going down to vote. But on the way, he ran across a pig with its head caught in an old wire fence squealing away. He stopped to save the pig, but it made him too late to get to the polls to vote. The election he missed, that he did not realize at the time, came down to the wire. As it turned out, the Democrats beat the Federalists in this election at Rhode Island by one vote. All right? And it was, could have been the one vote of this old farmer. Here's where it gets interesting. Also, by a one-vote margin, a Democrat was sent to the Continental Congress from Rhode Island. And upon, you know, upon his arrival, this particular Democrat was the swing vote that passed the decision to declare independence and go to war with England. So if you put all that together, you could say, in a way, that we owe the existence of the United States of America to a pig that get caught in the fence. <laughs> and I don't know if the story's true or not. I really don't. In fact, I've got my questions. But I do know that some of the details are, you know, there. You can read the history on it. The point is that one person, a one old pig, can make a difference. And that one person could be you. It could be you. When Peter healed that crippled man, it wasn't just one man's life that was changed. According to Acts 4.4, we're a little ways away from getting there. 2,000 people were added. And actually, it just says 2,000 men were added to the church through this. And for some reason, we're told how many women. We'll discuss that maybe another time. But when you make yourself available to God, you never know how far the impact is going to reach. And you might not think much of yourself. You might just consider yourself a pig. But if you are, be a pig for God. All right? Whatever it is that God has called you to be, be that for God. Because there is a great power that is at work within you. Because you were dead, but now you live. You were lost, but now you are found.
You were blind, but now you see. You were deaf, now you hear. You were lame, now you can walk. And you can be the person that God uses to do something wonderful in somebody's life. And I challenge you to start looking for that opportunity now. Deal? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you give us your word. It demonstrates how you work within us to give us hope, to give us life, to give us salvation, to give us a purpose, to give us a future. Not just here on earth, but for eternity as well. Father, we thank you. We thank you for saving us and redeeming us. We thank you for the powerful work that you have done within us. Forgive us if we have forgotten or lost the joy of our salvation. Forgive us if we have somehow shown our disrespect by not being amazed still by the power that you have worked in us already. Lord, use us. Break into our hearts. Make us person that you can use. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go.